glad to be here, um, and I really appreciate the opening comments from, from David and Jason um, because I think they've captured quite well the, the premise of biomimicry, which is, well, given that incredible wisdom of you know, what life has sort of figured out about what it means to live on this planet, how can we draw lessons from those? And we know that it was 3.8 billion years ago, uh, which is actually a really long time compared to the approximately 200,000 years that we as a species have been on this planet. Sort of the equivalent of we've been here for a few hours and life has been here for um, a little over 10 months. Um, and so when you put that into perspective, there's probably some wisdom that we might draw from that. And the, sort of the key to painting a picture of what our sustainable future might be is to ask the difference between what does it mean to be a species that fits upon the planet versus a species that fits within the planet, you know, fits in the rest of the ecosystems. And as part of that, we have to ask, um, well, we're one species, that's one of at least 30 million other species, which represent less than 1% of all the species that have ever lived here. So while we think of ourselves as pretty darn impressive, um, in the grand scheme of things, we are just a bit of a blip. And uh, therefore, it's worthy of sort of reconsidering um, where we get our advice from. And what I want to talk about when we think about what does it mean to paint a future world in which we as a species fit in, um, I'm drawn to the idea of, you know, how do the ecosystems flourish? And there are sort of four primary roles that different entities, different species play in an ecosystem. And they may play one or more of these roles. So we have producers, which are the primary and secondary producers. They they're the ones that create things. And we actually have done that part reasonably well, following a different set of rules than the other species, but we produce a lot of stuff, as Jason noted. We've had quite the footprint uh, on the planet. And then there are the consumers. There are the, you know, we've got a society that produces things, and then you've got a group of entities that consume those. Um, the role model, or the, the, the mental model that we've had behind this is this is a one-way street. We consume the planetary resources in order to create stuff which we consume and then we dump it out the other end. But there's two other roles that ecosystems have. One are the service providers, and we start to see in today's economy a lot more emphasis on the idea of being in the provision of services, that I don't really want a car, I merely want to be transported, and how can a business uh, provide that opportunity for me to be transported? But then the other and most important role are the decomposers. These are the deconstructors, the ones that take apart all of that which has been assembled and put it back into a state and a form in which it can be reassembled again. And of course, by adding the decomposers to the mix, we now have a, an interconnected web and we've got these loops that are inevitable. And when I think about what does it mean to have a world, and if you can imagine our transition from our society right now, we've got to add that niche to a living economy. And that's really where I see a huge opportunity. In fact, I've been talking to my children. If you want a guaranteed open space of opportunity, then figure out how to be in the business of de decomposing. And really that means things, everything from the businesses we're seeing now that are about mining our landfills, from the deconstruction of buildings, from the regeneration of sites, turning brown fields into green fields. All of that is about closing the loop and figuring out how we can have uh, these, these, that which we create so well be built out of that which we've already created and have uh, thought of disposing, but there's an incredible amount of, of market opportunity in that space. And by closing this loop and having all of these components and parts begin to play together, then we begin to look a lot more like the ecosystems upon which we thrive um, and depend and rely on, and therefore we're more likely to fit in. But the key is that we can't just add decomposers and put greater emphasis on service providers, that, that all four of those, producers, consumers, service providers, and decomposers, need to be more or less equally balanced in ratios in the system. Um, and that's where a huge opportunity space lies. But 
these all need to follow the same set of rules. And we call these rules life's principles, and, and Jason uh, mentioned the key component at the center of these life's principles, which is that life creates conditions conducive to life. And if we can't say that at the beginning of every one of our activities, then we've fundamentally failed the test of whether or not we're matching uh, what the other 30 million species do. And so if you think about what it means to design a system, uh, and, and how humans behave in that system, we've got to ask what rules we follow. And uh, if we follow the same rules that the other 30 million species have followed, then chances are that we might actually make it as a species and not go extinct. So some of those other rules are adapt to changing conditions. Um, we have a real fixation on trying to hold the bull still and saying we're not subject to all of those things that change and we put a lot of energy into maintaining a building that is always 68 degrees no matter what temperature it is outside or that we will not allow um, the, the tides or the changing um, rivers or whatever to affect us. We're going to build dams and dikes and walls. But what life does is it learns to be round. And as that bowl is shifting all the time, it learns to roll in that. And so we've got to build that in as our modus operandi, or else life is just going to slap us across the face a few more times with things like Katrina or tsunamis or whatever it is to say, no, actually, you can't hold that bowl still. Another part of that is being locally attuned and responsive, and the living buildings are only capable of being living buildings when they are locally attuned, when they recognize what's happening in that place. And I guarantee you won't find another species out there that hasn't figured out how to thrive in that particular place by understanding what those ecosystems mean. And it's fundamentally everything from, you know, you can't have a multinational corporation that is also locally tuned and responsive. And so this, this, uh, this idea that we can have one simple rule that governs the whole planet is completely antithetical to the way the planet works. We need to use life-friendly chemistry. Um, and so, yes, life uses toxins, but it only produces them in on demand, in the quantities they need. And when they're done with them, they break down into benign constituents. Unfortunately, we have a pretty good course, or a pretty good record of creating compounds which we think are not all that toxin, but then they break down into toxic elements, which is sort of beyond beyond understanding and once you get decomposers back in the mix they're going to tell you pretty quickly that I don't want your crap don't make it anymore I can't do anything with it and then that changes the name of the game too of course resource efficiency is something that the last 10 20 30 decades have put a lot of energy uh, and intention into whether it's uh, being more efficient with our energy and our materials so I think we have some headway in that uh, but a lot more room for improvement. One of the reasons why decomposers have such a hard time dealing with our stuff is because we put a lot of energy into making it in the first third law of thermodynamics reminds us that you have to put the same amount of energy in to take things back apart. Um, if you build with sunlight and you don't heat, beat, and treat, um, you can build an abalone shell that's the strongest ceramic on the planet. You can build a fiber that's as strong as fighters by using chopped up fly parts. Um, but instead, we dump lots of chemicals in and make Kevlar. So by learning from all of these lessons about how the other species have fit in for the last 3.8 billion years, then we might guarantee at least, I don't know, a few thousand more years for our species if we're lucky. But that's the, that's the, the goal that we've got to begin thinking about. <laughs>